Reflections we define as sound that be, bounces around the room like a billiard ball, right? You can, you can track the trajectory of mids and highs above the Schroeder frequency based on what angle is that sound leaving. You know, some sources are very omnidirectional, some sources are very directional. Speakers, for example, quite directional. The, the mid and high frequencies, we get a dispersion, we understand, you know, how wide does that speaker project, how tall does that speaker project, and then once we know when it's headed towards a wall, we can kind of say, okay, well, it's going to go there, and once it goes there, we know it's going to go there, because it behaves like light. Now, below the Schroeder frequency, Mike's going to kind of talk about how that kind of stuff behaves. It's a little bit different. Really, so I'm getting the easy job here, right, because conceptually, this is a little more it's a little easier to understand. You, you kind of see how a, a ball bounces off a wall and what directions it's going to go. If you understand billiards, you can kind of understand first reflections. The way we kind of look at this, or the way that we've always kind of told people to uh, look at this and think about it, is if I've got a frequency that hits my ears from my speaker, and then it's going to travel to the wall and then travel back. It's going to come back later in time, right? And James kind of pointed at this. Acoustics is a time-based problem. It shows up in the frequency response through phase cancellation, through f comb filtering. The, the frequencies that are louder that we're perceiving in this frequency retard graph, it's a, a constructive additive thing that happens between the direct and the reflected sound. Areas where there's less energy is, is a nulled uh, frequency, where when that frequency arrives a little bit later, the point that they both are at in that waveform determines that that frequency is not going to be heard, right? So what does this do to you? I mean, you're sitting there and you're trying to make choices about a mix, and let's say you think the voice is too sibilant. Well, I'm gonna turn down 3K, right? Because the voice is so sibilant. Well, if I've got a peak, in my response at, at 3K, that's not on tape. It's not bedded into the track, right? It's something that you're perceiving because of this distortion in the way your room is messing with your speaker response. So what we wanna do is we want to attenuate the, the reflection so that it doesn't arrive at the mix point and cause that problem. So, you know, you, you make this drastic move in the vocal track to get rid of 3K, go out to Dave's car with him, right? And, and listen to that track. And now, now the voice sounds like this. I've taken out all that sibilance because my speaker told me it was the thing to do. Now we've got to go back and, and correct, right? Because we thought we had a 3K problem based on what we heard, right? So we've, we've got to fix that problem. And the way we do that is by treating first reflection points. So if we go to this next slide, it's going to be a very basic sort of idea. Again, that blue line looks like a billiard shot going from the left speaker to the left wall and hitting that very round head. And then the right speaker also has its reflection path that's going from that same left wall and hitting that same very round head. We know we want to hit these points and, and you can use a mirror to find that point. If you're sitting in your room at your desk and your speakers, have somebody move a mirror along your wall, you see the speaker, that's the reflection point. Because again, these frequencies behave like light. So we're looking at light when we're doing that, right? So if I were to put a little patch of absorption on my left wall, just big enough for where that red line is going to hit, right? And I do that same thing where that blue line is going to hit, I could sit right here and everything would be perfect, right? But I can't do anything because it's just that one point. So if we go to the next slide, what we're looking at, and we don't even need the last slide because I'm just going to explain it here. What you're looking at here is your room on the left side, right? On the right side, I've, I've made a mirror of that room, right? So I'm not looking in a mirror. I'm conceptually putting it in 2D, right? So instead of just worrying about where that tiny little head is, what we want to do is worry about where that larger circle is. And what that does is that gives me this freedom. You know, if I want to lean back and listen to my mix, if I want to lean forward and listen to my mix, if I've got to reach for a compressor and make sure it's not bypassed, you want to maintain that reflection-free relationship with your speakers for all the places in the room that's going to be viable for you. Now, if this is a home studio, that, that might be all you need to do on the right wall, right? Where this red cone and this blue cone are intersecting. But maybe you've got a client count you back, right? So maybe we want to worry about the reflections for that person too, right? Maybe there's a producer's desk. 
you start drawing a lot more dots, you start drawing a lot more circles. You start needing to increase that reflection area. We've got a myriad of panels at GIK that can sort of help with this, absorption panels. And back to the idea that James brought up with sound having size, and those big, really distinct spikes in the low end, right? You could use a thin panel and, and affect the reflective re relationship between you and that speaker. But if you do that, you're, you're really sort of missing an opportunity to also work on those really defined low frequency spikes, right? And like Mike's gonna talk about where bass traps go. How far do we wanna take it, really? You know, that's gonna be sort of the question. How far can we take it? It's, there's gonna be size restrictions. There's gonna be budget restrictions. So, you know, it's very common to start with maybe a two, three inch thick panel. That's only gonna affect that frequency uh, spectrogram that we looked at earlier, 300 hertz. You know, it's not doing anything to the base range. But if we make this first reflection panel a little bit thicker, you know, like James did with those two four fours, that's how we start to see all this improvement in a frequency range. Like, think of it this way. We're putting that panel there because it's a first reflection point. But if we make it thicker, we're going to not just impact the reflection, we're going to also impact the low end holistically in the room. So anytime you have the opportunity, you want to do that. What's the best panel for this? The thickest one, right? In the studios here, they're incredibly thick, you know, and, and they're diffusion in some cases, and that's a very unique situation that you don't see really anywhere else in the room, in the world, and that room's one of one. Typically, we're using very thick absorption, ideally. Uh, but what we want to do as an acoustic designer is sort of back up, look at the whole plan. What kind of investment do we have that we're going to make on this room, right? And if we think of the idea that, you know, I'm going to start this plan with two four fours. They're, they're a relatively low cost per foot panel. And I put a couple on the left wall. I put a right wall, ceiling corners, you can grow with that, right? Because, you know, cr make the sweet spot bigger by later on down the road, when you get a little more coin in your pocket, uh, take those two four fours that used to be in your corner and make the sweet spot bigger, right? Add more coverage to the ceiling, add more coverage to the sidewall, give yourself more freedom. Like you, you, James's situation, which obviously was an incredible improvement with those panels, relatively cost affordable and kind of the way that we're gonna recommend that anyone starts their room. You're, you're starting with a panel that's thick enough to be a toolkit in any kind of situation where you move that around and, and you know upgrade the corners later. And, and Mike will talk a little bit more about that. But also, to this point, we've really only looked at stereo, you know, and oftentimes, particularly now, um, surround sound is, is more and more of a focus. So if we look at, you know, just say like a 7.1 system, right, the person would still be sat here, but I'm trying to clean this up and not show you everything in the mirrored reflection of this room, like the speakers aren't there, but this is where that person sat. Right? So now we're looking at all these different places where the trajectory of each of these speakers is going to impact that listening zone, right? So what's happening? Now, we used to just cover this. Now we, now we need to cover this if we want to maintain frequency integrity for the surrounds, the, the rears, the center, all of that. But also you're noticing there's a lot of overlap, right? Like we don't need to dedicate, oh, this is my center channel panel, right? because that's kind of taken care of with the red and blue panel, right? So you're, you're sort of doing this study of the room and how much reflection control you need. And it's worth pointing out that the more reflection control you need, the thicker those panels really should be. It's going to be something that Paul's going to sort of touch on with this, the balance of the room. If I'm on a budget and I start hitting all of these surround sound speaker reflection points with the very thin panels you're gonna very quickly run out of real estate for base traps to keep up and keep that balance intact, so, right? So surround rooms specifically tend to need thicker panels because they're going to need so much more square foot of coverage to get that job done. It sort of needs to be thicker. Otherwise, you're gonna end up with, uh, Paul will talk more about this. First reflection points on front and rear walls, right? So. Um, a stereo room, you're not terribly concerned about the front wall because traditional studio monitors don't really send information towards the front wall. You capture all those reflections on the rear wall. They've been 
they've been captured. They don't need to be trapped when they can't bounce to the front wall. But when you've got rear speakers, you know, the front wall does become more reflectively problematic just because of the direction that those speakers are pointing in, right? So here again, we're just hammering home more coverage for more speakers.